Introduction Few warriors are as famous as the Japanese samurai. We remember those beautiful swords and those fearsome helmets. We recall, with both horror and fascination, how some chose to end their own lives. But no one can understand the samurai without knowing Minamoto Yoshitsune. Yoshitsune's story unfolds in the late 12th century, during the adolescence of the samurai. Yes, cultures have their youth, maturity, and old age, just as people do. During Yoshitsune's lifetime, the samurai awakened. Their culture was bold, rebellious, and eager to flex its muscle. The samurai would ultimately destroy Japan's old way of life and forge a new one using fire and steel and pain. Yoshitsune was at the very heart of the samurai rising. Exile, runaway, fugitive, rebel, and hero, he became the most famous warrior in Japanese history. The reason is simple. Yoshitsune was the kind of man other samurai longed to be. Chapter 1 Disaster in Kyoto Kyoto, 1160 Minamoto Yoshitsune's inheritance arrived early. The boy could not yet walk when his father left him a lost war, a shattered family, and a bitter enemy. Yoshitsune's father prepared for battle in the cold darkness of a winter night. Warrior pride demanded elegance, so servants led out two war horses, one black and one white, for him to choose between. He ordered pine torches held aloft. The bronze and silver fittings on the horse's saddles flashed and sparkled in the light. When one goes into battle, nothing is so important as one's horse, Yoshitsune's father declared. Yoshitsune's father was the leader of the Minamoto Samurai. Five hundred warriors followed him as he rode astride his black war horse through the shadowy streets of Kyoto. Surely, the commoners who lived along the way, fishmongers and silk weavers, carpenters and midwives, beggars and papermakers, were awakened by the clattering of two thousand hoofs. Just as surely, they clutched their children close and remained silent, knowing that nothing good ever comes of heavily armed men moving in the dead of night. Two hours after midnight, Yoshitsune's father and his men reached their target, the palace of the retired emperor. The Minamoto forces barged through the palace gates, dragged the startled retired emperor from his slumber, and shoved him into an ox cart. The cart rolled away with Yoshitsune's father riding guard alongside. Never before had a samurai dared to lay hands on a former emperor. As head of the imperial family, the retired emperor wielded enormous power. The reigning emperor, the retired emperor's teenage son, served as a figurehead. The retired emperor was the true ruler. He wrote the laws, controlled the government, and awarded titles and land to the Japanese elite. In addition to his power, the retired emperor enjoyed enormous prestige. Japanese emperors were considered semi-divine descendants of the sun goddess. Most people would think twice about kidnapping a demigod, but Yoshitsune's father was not a think-twice sort of person. Plus, he was in a nasty snit. A few years earlier, he had taken the retired emperor's side in a political dispute. When the retired emperor won the dispute, Yoshitsune's father had expected a lofty title and the wealth that went with it. Instead, he was named Minister of the Stables of the Left. A rival samurai leader named Taira Kiyomori, who had also backed the retired emperor, received a much grander reward. To get back at those who had slighted him, Yoshitsune's father was willing to risk his own life, the lives of his men, and the lives of his children. He hoped that by kidnapping the retired emperor, he could seize control of Japan. He planned to force the retired emperor to heap titles on him while stripping them away from Taira Kiyomori. But first, 
Yoshitsune's father wanted the retired emperor to know just how angry he was about that minister of the stables of the left business. He ordered his men to burn the retired emperor's palace. The Minamoto samurai set the wooden buildings ablaze. They lined the avenues outside the palace gates and drew their bows. Everyone who tried to escape was shot down, whether nobleman, lady in waiting, or servant boy. A war chronicle says if they sought to avoid the arrows, they were consumed by fire. Those who quailed before the arrows and were terrified by the fire jumped into a well. But those on the bottom drowned in the water, and those on top were buried by ash and embers from the multitude of buildings burning in the violent wind, and not a single one of them was saved. As smoke and screams filled the air around the flaming palace, news of the attack spread. Yoshitsune's father had waited for his nemesis Taira Kiyomori to leave town before kidnapping the retired emperor. But as soon as messengers reached Kiyomori, the Taira lord readied to ride to the retired emperor's defense. Kiyomori dressed in black laced armor and black bearskin boots and carried a black lacquer scabbard. Black lacquered arrows. From his helmet rose a brilliant silver ornament shaped like monstrous beetle horns. Mounted on a thickly muscled black horse, the dark knight of Kyoto galloped home. Other Taira samurai rushed to their leader's side. By the time Kiyomori reached the capital, he had gathered 300 warriors. Yoshitsune's father and his 500 followers had taken over another imperial palace in Kyoto. Taira Kiyomori led the counterattack. Despite a fierce fight, the outnumbered Taira were unable to dislodge the Minamoto. Kiyomori and his men began to withdraw. Yoshitsune's father assumed that the Taira were retreating toward Kiyomori's mansion east of the city, and he couldn't resist the temptation to crush his arch rival. He ordered his warriors into pursuit. As soon as the Minamoto left the safety of the palace walls, squads of Taira attacked from all sides. The retreat had been a ruse. The Taira had simply circled around the block. Arrows sliced in from every direction. Unable to retreat, the Minamoto samurai were stamped out like the embers of a dying fire. Meanwhile, the retired emperor was being held prisoner at an imperial library elsewhere in Kyoto. He disguised himself as a common gentleman, walked past his Minamoto guards, and fled into the snow frosted hills. The entire war was now entirely pointless. Yoshitsune's father had ridden to war with his two eldest sons, a 19 year old and a 16 year old. During the battle outside the palace, the older boy fought bravely but was captured by Kiyomori's men. The younger boy suffered a deep arrow wound in his knee. Yoshitsune's father and his wounded son, protected by a small band of loyal warriors, managed to break through the Taira lines. They rode east toward the Minamoto homeland. Yoshitsune's father planned to gather reinforcements and return to battle. But as they rode, his wounded son's condition grew steadily worse. At last, unable to go on, the boy begged to be killed. His father obliged. At last, Yoshitsune's father and his remaining men stopped to rest at the home of a retainer, a lower ranking samurai who had pledged his service and loyalty. But pledging is one thing, true loyalty is another. This retainer didn't want to be allied with a loser. He offered Yoshitsune's father a bath, which was gratefully accepted. The retainer's men then burst into the bathroom and murdered Yoshitsune's father. Only his head returned to Kyoto. The bloody trophy was tied to a sandalwood tree beside the Kyoto prison gate. There it rotted, a sharp reminder that when you go into battle, the most important thing isn't selecting your horse. The most important thing is winning. But Taira Kiyomori wasn't satisfied with his enemy's death. He also wanted his enemy's sons. Kiyomori now held both the 19 year old who had fought in the battle and a 14 year old who hadn't ridden to war. Kiyomori had the older boy beheaded, but hadn't yet decided what to do with the younger boy. 
The Taira Lord knew that Yoshitsune's father, who, like other well-born Japanese men, had multiple wives, also had three young sons by a wife named Tokiwa. Tokiwa had a seven-year-old boy, a five-year-old boy, and a baby named Yoshitsune. Despite their youth and innocence, Taira Kiyomori wanted those sons as well. After all, samurai boys would grow up to bear swords and grudges. Tokiwa knew this too. As soon as she learned of her husband's death, she fled Kyoto with Yoshitsune bundled against her chest and his older brothers clutching her robes. Frost paralyzed the trees and ice stilled the rivers as they stumbled half-blind through clouding snow. When they reached Tokiwa's relatives in a nearby town, terrible news awaited. Kiyomori had arrested Tokiwa's mother and was torturing her to find out where Tokiwa and her sons were hiding. In hopes of saving her mother, but terrified for her sons, Tokiwa led her children back to Kyoto. The forlorn family surrendered at the gates of Kiyomori's mansion. Triumphant Kiyomori could not resist a peek at his dead rival's wife. After all, Tokiwa's looks were legendary. It was said she had arrived in Kyoto as a teenager to compete for the position of imperial lady-in-waiting. Out of a thousand pretty girls, the hundred most lovely were chosen, and then the ten most radiant, and finally the most beautiful of all, Tokiwa. And so Yoshitsune's mother, the 12th century beauty queen, was brought before Kiyomori, victorious samurai lord. Tokiwa clutched little Yoshitsune to her chest and begged Kiyomori to kill her first. Every mother, high or low, wanders in darkness for love of her children, Tokiwa said, tears raining down her face. I know that I could not live a moment longer without them. Maybe Kiyomori felt a stirring of Buddhist compassion. Maybe something else moved the samurai as he gazed upon Tokiwa, so dazzling, so desperate. What harm, Kiyomori must have reasoned, could come of mercy? Tokiwa's fatherless children needn't become warriors. The older ones could be sent to Buddhist temples and trained as monks. In a few years, baby Yoshitsune could follow the same quiet path. Why not? After all, the Taira had won the war. Surely the scattered sons of the Minamoto and little Yoshitsune in particular could pose no possible threat. Kiyomori was wrong. Utterly, fatally wrong.